All right. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. I hope you're having a good New York Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, we're very happy to have you here today to train you on using IMAP Invasive to report invasive species. Um, I believe most of you are muted. Um, I'm going to ask you to stay that way during the presentation. Um, but as questions come up, there is a chat box that you can enter into. Some people have found that. Um, so it's, um, there's a little, if you wave over your screen, there's a little speech bubble icon, and that's how you access the chat box. Um, so today we'll be talking about how to use IMAP Invasive, particularly the mobile app. And our presenters are going to be myself, the end user support specialist for New York Natural Heritage Program. Um, we also have Andrew Randazzo from DEC Division of Lands and Forests. And we also have Meg Wilkinson, Invasive Species Database Program Coordinator. Um, she will not be presenting today, but she is monitoring the chat box, so you might see her responding uh, to questions. Um, and so that's who we are, and it, it would be great if some of you could introduce yourselves as well. I see some of you have already, and that's great. Um, so I have some prompts on the right side if you can Give us your name, and if you're representing an organization, you can give us that, too. Um, we're curious, have you used the IMAP mobile app before? And um, since it's New York Invasive Species Awareness Week, a lot of people might have been learning new species, so name the latest invasive you've learned about. And with that, I think I'll get to it. So I mentioned that uh, I'm from the New York National Heritage Program. Um, our mission is to facilitate conservation of New York's biodiversity by providing information and expertise on rare species and natural ecosystems uh, to conservation partners. And we're a partnership between the DEC and SUNY ESF. Um, you may have heard of us from programs including Trees for Tribs or our conservation guides. Um, but since from our mission statement, um, you might notice that we do a lot of work with rare species and ecosystems, um, but we also recognize that invasive species pose a huge threat to rare species in New York State. So we also have the Invasive Species Database Program, and we are the ones who manage IMAP invasives for New York State. And we also uh, do a couple of other projects, including WISPA, um, that's the survey that stewards use across the state to track invasive species, um, and also some spatial prioritization models. Um, so we have collaborated with other people at New York Natural Heritage Program um, to provide these maps that sort of highlight the areas that are the most, uh, most at risk to the spread of invasives and also um, the most valuable to protect. And just to get us all on the same page, um, invasive species are species that are non-native, so they're from somewhere else, somewhere outside of New York, um, and they're, they have negative impacts. This can be to the environment, the economy, or human health. Um, so as an example, in this picture, there's this huge amount of uh, knotweed that's overtaking a rare species. So knotweed is that, uh, green that you can see on the bottom, all those leaves. And then there are some rare species um, sort of on the rocky outcrop cliff sort of thing in the back right of the picture. Um, so that's one example of an impact that an invasive species can have. So it's crowding out rare native species. And so these invasive species cause a lot of problems across the world um, and in New York as well. Um, and there's been a lot of work into figuring out what can we do about this huge problem. And a lot of that depends on where an invasive species falls on this invasion curve. So um, this curve kind of shows that in the early stages of an invasion uh, where maybe the species isn't here yet or it's started to come here in little clumps. Um, at that point, 
um, it is possible to control, still possible to eradicate, um, and then as it gets cover more area, um, it's much harder to manage. Um, so the way that we manage invasive species and strategize our management depends on where it is on this invasion curve. And to understand where it is on this invasion curve, we really need to have up-to-date information on invasive species distributions. And here's an example of what that can look like. So this is for Tree of Heaven. Um, this is an invasive species that we'll be talking about later um, that hosts an even more dangerous invasive species called spotted lanternfly. Um, and so these orange blocks show places where uh, Tree of Heaven has been recorded. Um, and you'll see there's a lot of blank spots. So the question is what's going on here? So is Tree of Heaven really not there or have we just not surveyed for it? And so IMAP Invasive has been tasked to sort of fill these uh, needs. Um, so several jurisdictions across North America use IMAP Invasive. In New York, it's the centralized invasive species database to support PRISMs, which I'll explain later. Um, state agencies and other partners working on invasive species issues. Um, so the big thing we, IMAP Invasive does is it provides species distributions and reports. Um, it also allows for early detection alerts. So there are email alerts that uh, anyone can set up for key species or for any species they're interested in. Um, we also provide these web map services so that the data can be used live in a number of platforms. Um, and we also allow for the tracking of control efforts and results. And I just mentioned PRISMs. So these stand for Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management. Um, so you can see on this map uh, where all the PRISMs are. Um, so you can kind of look to where you're located to figure out which prism you fall into. Um, so I live uh, outside of Saratoga Springs, so I'm in the Capital Region prism. Um, and these are just really great resources for uh, staying connected to invasive species efforts in your region. Um, they have a lot of knowledge on invasives in your region. Um, And so I've been talking about this IMAP invasive database, but where does the data actually come from? So at first it was mostly from existing data sets from various different organizations who had been collecting data um, on paper or in spreadsheets um, and so uploading those large databases into the database. But since then it has really shifted to um, ongoing data collection being more important being a huge contribution to this database. Um, so data entered by community scientists and professionals are really what we rely on for having up-to-date information on invasive species. Um, so that means that you all on this call are an extremely important um, data source for New York State invasive species efforts. And one thing I'll mention is that um, so anyone can submit a record to IMAP Invasive and it goes in unconfirmed and then a second set of eyes will go in and look at it. Uh, most of these people are PRISM staff or work for a state agency, um, and they will look at your record, uh, look at the picture you took, and see if it matches the species, and then they will set your record to confirm. And so with that uh, introduction of what IMAP Invasives is and how it fits into invasive species efforts, in New York. Um, this is what we will be talking about today. Um, so we're going to give an IMAP Invasive training. Um, I'm going to show you how to set up an account if you haven't done so already. Um, then Andrew is going to give a run through of the mobile app. And I'm going to show you what happens to your data after you submit it on the mobile app. And uh, then we're going to go through some species IDs. And we are trying to think of some species um, that are 
important and impactful invasive species that you are likely to find and um, yeah, basically ones that you could find uh, even in your neighborhood or backyard if that's um, where you'll be looking. And so I'll start with the IMAC invasive training. Um, I want to clarify the difference between the web application and the mobile app. Um, so the mobile app is the simple data collection tool that you can use in the field to report observations of invasive species. Um, you get it from the app store. And then the whole database exists on this browser-based interface on the web. Um, and that's the online web application. So imapinvasive.natureserve.com. And this is where all the data lives and uh, where you can view it and everything. Um, but you can access this from a browser on your computer. Um, that's what happens in most cases, I think. But you can also access it on your phone. So sometimes there's confusion um, if you're on the IMAP Invasive web application on your phone. Um, that's still not considered the mobile app. That's something separate from your browser. So we're going to start on the online web application um, to set up your account. And one thing I'll note is that you should use uh, Chrome or Firefox. Um, you can also use Safari if you're on an iPhone or uh, Apple computer. Um, but we don't recommend using Internet Explorer or Microsoft Edge. And so to get to where you can make an IMAP Invasives account, um, you go to nyimapinvasives.org. And I'm going to ask um, anyone who's interested or who doesn't have an account or wants to check if they can log in to please follow along because um, you really need to make sure your online account is up and running and you can access it um, before you try to get your app up and running. It's very important to do this first step. So go to the login button at the right of nyimapinvasive.org. And um, if anyone has issues along the way, again, you can comment that into the chat box. So when you uh, go to nyimapinvasive.org and click the login button at the right, it'll bring you to this page. Um, so on the top, there's a login bar. So this is what you use if you already have an account. If you haven't logged in in a while since last spring, uh, you may have to click here and reset your account. So just hit the forgot password uh, button and you'll reset your password to reactivate your account. Um, and then if you don't have an account, there's this big sign up box underneath the login bar. So this is where you create an account. Put in your name, uh, your email that you want to use. And for this jurisdiction, uh, select New York if that's where you're collecting invasive species observations. Um, and then once you hit that join button, it will uh, send an email to the email address you use. And in that email in your box, um, it'll have this click here link that brings you to a user agreement. Um, and once you read that user agreement and accept it, then you'll be able to log in to IMAP Invasives and your account will be active. Um, sometimes people um, have difficulties finding this email. Uh, sometimes it ends up in the spam box. So if you're not seeing this email after joining um, IMAP Invasives, um, I would recommend that you check your spam box before trying to sign up again. because. You only use this sign up box once. Um, so once you have used that sign up box once, you won't be able to use it again. You will only use the login at the top. And so I hope most of you have been able to log in to IMAP Invasive. Um, this is the screen that it brings you to. Um, so it's this map in the background and a pop-up that has uh, any recent updates to the website. So we do add new features um, and fix bugs periodically. So 
Um, once you get yourself up to date on what's, what's new, you can exit that out. And then it brings you to this main map. And just to give you a brief orientation of where everything is, um, there's this main menu on the top left. That's really the most important um, for setting up your account. The rest is more if you're interested in the database and want to explore some invasive distributions some more. Um, there's navigation tools. So you can use those to zoom to your location or another location. There's these action tools at the top. Uh, for instance, you can filter the records that you're seeing to only one species that you're interested in or just your the records you've recorded. And then we have uh, geographic layers on the right. Um, and this is how you control what you're seeing on the map. So the default is that it's set to uh, presence records. You could toggle on not detected if you're interested in seeing that, for instance. And um, so we're going to focus on the main menu first. Um, so if you click that main menu on the top left, um, the little three bars with a leaf behind it, it'll bring you to this drop down. And the one that you need to use to finish setting up your account is the Your Account button. Um, so that'll bring you to your account page, has your information on top. And then below that are organizations and projects. And so these may be empty for some of you, and for some of you that's fine. For others, you may want to join an organization or project. And to do that, you go to edit. Just to explain what these organizations and projects are so that you know whether you need to worry about this or not. Um, organizations, um, these are usually staff only. Um, so this is typically if you are conducting invasive species work as a part of your job, then you would need to join your employer's organization. Um, if you're a volunteer citizen scientist, then you probably do not need to worry about organizations. And then for projects, um, these are other ways to group data. Um, for instance, some PRISMs will do a volunteer project and they'll ask volunteers to join a certain project so that the data is all together. Um, so if you ever do any of those sorts of projects, this is how you will join that project. So you would click edit on the top right. And so if you want to join your organization or project now, you can follow along. Um, if you don't, then just uh, watch this so that you know how to do it later on if you decide to. So you click the edit button on the top right, scroll down to the organization box or the project box and hit uh, request to join. And then you'll be able to type in whatever you are hoping to join. And then you can press save on the top right corner once you've hit request to join. And you really have to make sure to press that save button for it to save this change. Um, and then your organization or project will appear in that box and it will list you as a pending member until the admin for that organization or project changes you to member. And one other optional uh, feature of IMAX that you can use are these email alerts. So uh, state officials and other invasive species professionals use these to get alerts for new observations so that they can do early detection and rapid response. Um, but we can also all use these email alerts. Uh, I have one for Hemophilia adelgid in the capital region prism because um, that's a species that interests me in an area where I am. Um, and to get to these, um, you go into that main menu, uh, the top left leaf icon on your IMAP invasive screen, and you go to your email alerts right under your account. And so that brings you up to this email alerts page. Um, there are some alerts already set up that you can opt in or out of. 
Um, for instance, I'm on this screenshot, I am opt into an alert for when a presence record I created is the first of its species recorded in the region. Um, so that's good to know if I've reported something and it's the first one in that region. And above that, um, there's an alert for if your record gets updated. So if your record gets confirmed, for instance, that might be interesting to see. And you can opt in and out by doing this add edit alert, and you can also add custom alerts. So that's where you can do a individual species or say aquatic plants or something and a region that you're interested in, whether that be a county or a specific conservation area. And um, that was everything for setting up your online account. So you're able to follow along to where you made an IMAP Mesa's account online. You should be all set to use the mobile app. Um, if there have been any questions, uh, you can type those into the chat box. Um, I could address any now, but it doesn't look like Mitchell, there's anything. Yeah. I'll point out that there are people on the call who did have IMAP accounts that they have not logged into since April of 2019. So those are mm -hmm. people who would want to use that forgot password that you pointed out. Mm -hmm. Right there. Yep. Yep. And if by yep. chance you don't have access to the email that that account is with, let us, you know, put that in the chat box and I can update it to your current email. Thank you. And so with that, that's everything from uh, setting up your account on the online web application. So now we can switch to the mobile app. Um, so you would get out of your browser and download the app from the app store. And Andrew is going to deliver this part of the presentation. So I'll turn it over to Andrew. All right, well, hi everybody. Um, I'm Andrew Randazzo. I work for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, and um, I work with the Lands and Forests, and I do a lot of education and outreach, and a big topic we address is invasive species. So I just want to encourage you all to, if you haven't already, go ahead and go to your app store um, and download the app. Um, in the app store, it's IMAP Invasives Mobile is the title of it. So I do, I would love for you to follow along, and of course, the same applies here where you can type in the question to the chat box. So if you make sure you go ahead and, and download it, you'll be able to, um, we'll do go through and do a test run of reporting a species. So it will give you a real feel for how to use this. Uh, and so the mobile app is, is just so great because it's super simple, um, but you're collecting really important data, you know, as a citizen science or perhaps scientist or as perhaps in partnership with your organization. So we want to be comfortable using it, um, and that's a big goal we have. So please, um, Meg will help us with any troubleshooting you have. So please just chat any questions you have, um, nothing too big or too small. Uh, okay, Mitch, next slide. So we like to think about the mobile app a little bit like a sandwich because who doesn't like to think about food from time to time? Um, and you need connectivity at some parts and you don't have to be connected to Wi-Fi at other parts. So this first part we're gonna go through, I think if you hit the slide one more time, Mitch, um, is you re requires connectivity, right? So you have to be connected to Wi-Fi, it's the bread, the first part of that bread, the sandwich. And later on, we'll go on to talk about recording invasive species where you don't need the Wi-Fi. Next. Okay, so hopefully you all have uploaded um, or downloaded the app um, and are, uh, can get onto it on your mobile device. If you are having any issues, just ask questions. Um, but speaking of food references, if you got the map open, there's this little hamburger, those three lines in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and if you press on that, that will give you a drop-down me menu and it will take you to preferences. So if you go ahead and click on that preferences, if this is your first time using the app, 
it will probably open that preferences uh, menu as a default. Okay, next. So you're gonna wanna enter the email you signed up with on the IMAP of ACES. If you just did it or just updated it, you'll use that email. Um, and then type in your password here and uh, hit that retrieve IMAP list, okay? Um, and so that will give you this green box. Hopefully, if you get the red box, it means there's some sort of issue, perhaps the spelling of the password and you can sort of cross verify with your uh, desktop or um, the web application to make sure that your password is correct and working. If you're still having issues logging in after you've tried it um, on the web, or if you can't get into the mobile app for whatever reason, just let us know, because um, you'll need to be have this connected in order to follow along with our sample reporting. Um, and so, got this green box and what that did is it connected your project and your organization um, and and you don't have to have those but it also just connects your account in general okay next slide so the if you scroll down a little bit there are some um, preferences and I think Mitch can you just hit it two three more times and um, so that that, there's different options here. Most of these are optional, but we're going to practice um, setting up a custom species list. If you click on that custom species list, um, you'll notice it's a quite a long list. So that whole list will come up when you're for making an observation if you don't make a shorter list. So we're going to go ahead and try that out. Click on the common species list. Um, and then we have up here on the screen common reed phragmites. Snake species, which is a really important one to enter, uh, giant hogweed, knotweed, and tree of heaven. So if you want to go ahead, take a moment, and uh, select each of those onto your custom list, um, that will um, get you all set up so we can go through the second part quicker. It's really important if you do nothing else to put that fake species on because that's the one we'll be using today. Um, so, but you'll notice other things on this on this list. Um, you know, you can switch between common and scientific names. You can adjust the picture quality. The defaults are normally just fine. Um, and today we'll just leave them as is. But if at a later point you want to come back and play with the app a little bit, you're certainly welcome to do that. Okay, scroll down a little. Or next slide. If you scroll down on your phone, um, that's where it come. You have your project. Your organization, um, and then um, it can you can also uncheck that welcome instructions if you'd like. But um, um, you don't have to have the project or organization. But this is where you could set it to default to come up if you do. So if you're working with an organization on a specific project, or if you want your record to be associated with an organization, you can set that to a default right now, where every time you go into um, using an op or making an observation, those will come up so you don't forget to associate it with that organization because that will group all your data together, which is important if you're working on a specific project, but it's not required if you're just sort of flying solo. Um, and of course, save the record um, and that will update your settings. So I'll just pause here. Does anybody have any questions that they need to put in the chat? Is anybody feeling stuck? Or are we good to keep moving? Uh, Looks like we're all oh. <laughs> muted and unmuted. <laughs> I think we're good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So on to the next slide. All right. So we finished our first part of the the sandwich. We got through our bread. Now we're on to the meat or the veggies, depending on what kind of sandwich you're having. And you don't need connectivity at this point, which is great because you can be outside in a more uh, remote place and still be collecting data, including your location data, without having signal or service. And it will store it on your phone until you're able to go back. So that's a great feature of this app. Next. Okay, so the. To get started, just go ahead and click Add Observation in that upper right-hand corner, um, and that will open up this whole menu for you. Next. 
And so the first step is your photo. A photo is really important when you're um, uh, logging an observation because it's hard for us to have any valuable data um, if you don't have a photo. So what you can do um, is you can take a photo right now, uh, or you could even select a photo from your library if you're okay with sharing it, but just take a photo of just anything that you don't mind uploading and, um, and test it out. Um, the library function is great in case you forgot to um, upload a species when you're out in the field. Um, you could select that photo from the library. You would just have to adjust the location, but we recommend that you try to log it out in the field because you'll get a more accurate location using your phone's GPS probably than trying to place it on the map. But if you forget, you could try and use that. Okay, next. Okay, so you wanna make sure this is checked as custom list. So when we're in our preferences, we created this custom list and that will give you a shorter list to scroll through. And then in that next dropdown box, you're gonna select fake species. This is where you would put whatever species you think it might be. Japanese knotweed, honeysuckle, and there's a whole laundry list of invasive species on here that you could go through. Next. But for this one, you're just gonna choose that fake species because that's this data is gonna be cleared out at a later point. So this is just sort of for us to learn. Um, and then, so you can select a species detected or a species not detected. Um, and let's go with species not detected, de I'm sorry, species not detected today because this is just as important. Probably a lot of your um, observations are gonna be species detected. You're gonna be out hiking or working and you're going to come across maybe um, some sort of invasive species of whatever it is, um, and you're gonna click species detected because you found the species, right? But knowing where species aren't is um, just as important. And Mitch sort of talked about those data gaps before. We can fill in those data gaps by having people log where you don't find a species. And this is really important for some species like Tree of Heaven, which are a priority for us right now, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but for now, just go ahead and, and click that species not Next. Um, okay, scroll down on this observation page on your app. It will, it will come up with a map and your latitude or longitude. Sometimes that map won't show up if you're in like a, a more isolated area and don't have good connectivity, but as long as those coordinates come up, in that latitude longitude box, the location box, you're good to go. Um, and if you if your issues with it, it may be related to your not sharing your location data with the app. So you may have to go into the settings on your mobile device and change those settings in order to get this to come up. Um, and then there is the option up in upper in the upper left hand corner um, to uncheck that GPS box to manually loop move the location if you thought there was some sort of issue or if you were logging a later species. But probably in most circumstances, it's best to use your, your GPS. And there's even a little accuracy box on there that shows you GPS ac accuracy at the current time, how close you are getting to it. Um, so um, the latitude or longitude, as long as that's showing up, you're good to go. And we'll move on to the next slide. And then we have uh, your, your project or your organization. That's optional data. You can change something or select something if it's not coming up. But if you set it as your default, uh, that will automatically come up. But of course you can unselect it if for whatever reason you don't want it to be associated with your project or your organization. The next part is this time select, which is actually a pretty important data, or I'm sorry, time search which is actually a pretty important data point because it gives us an idea of, well, how hard did you look, especially when you're thinking about a not detected species. Now, if you look for only one or two minutes, we're gonna know, okay, there's area, but if you look for a half an hour, we're gonna feel a little bit more certain that you, you thoroughly search the area. Uh, and then of course you can put in comments. Um, and so the comment might be, if you think that even with GPS data, it's gonna be hard to find the species, you could describe, um, you know, something that it's near or provide something significant about what you saw 
just to communicate more data because of course this data is going to be verified by actual people you know and the more information they have the better um and so if for this purpose you you don't have to enter anything in if you want to put something in just to test it out um you can um, but for just for our fake species we can just go ahead and save it as is you click that save button in order to um in order to log it and then that will take you to your home screen so next slide oh yeah i just want to point out that good photos are so important so you can see in these photos here that this is this is a hemlock tree and the underneath that the, this is the underside of the hemlock tree and it has these you know aphid like insects on it called hemlock woolly adalgid and this is actually a really important invasive species that we're trying to know where it is and where it isn't. We need people like you to be looking out for that. But if it's really blurry, something that small is so hard for us to see. So next slide. Um, so if you, oh, do we have a question? Oh, I'm go ahead. When you're done that photo, there's another photo question, but I forgot there was more to the slide. Go ahead, go ahead Andrew. Um, so you can focus in with some easy tricks right making sure you're close enough using your hand or a paper behind the species can really help you focus and then a lot of phones or mobile devices give you the ability to sort of touch on the screen to focus in a little bit so this is a good opportunity um you know for you to to practice when you're going out to use this app app to, to get some better photos because that's such an important thing as far as us being able to verify the data and see you know, that it is in fact the species that's being reported. So Meg, it sounds like maybe we had a question. Yes, thank you, Andrew. Uh, and HWA is an example I can um, cover. The, the question is about a photo of not detected. So in the world of HWA, taking a picture of a hemlock tree uh, that has none of the fuzzy white cotton balls on it and has nice new growth is a great not detected photo. Mitchell, do you want to talk about with other species what the not detected might look like? Sure. Um, yeah, you could. So say if you were um, doing a not detected for Tree of Heaven, um, you could. We'll talk a little bit later about where a good place to find Tree of Heaven would be. Um, so you could take a picture of that area to show that like you're looking at the right habitat. Um, so you wouldn't have to take like a close up on a certain plant necessarily, but you could still take a picture of the area where you surveyed and did not find the species. But I guess like the, the close up, um, like focus for ID purposes, that's not really as important for the not detected as it is for the presence record. Yeah, and that's such a Point. And, uh, you know, I saw some of you all maybe work for friends groups or um, volunteer for some community group like that. And this is that not detected is actually a great way because sometimes you go out looking for hemlock woolly adalgid and then you don't find it, which is great news. But then your volunteers can't necessarily do anything with the app, but that's not the case. They can always use that not detected and still take the photos and still log that they didn't see it. Um, and you can give them some a good interactive, you know, engaging program if that's something that you're um, leading. Okay, next slide. Okay, so it brings us back to the sandwich, right? We got through the meat or the veggies or whatever you got on your sandwich where you don't need your connectivity. And then you you have to reconnect at some point. It doesn't have to be right away, but if you it's probably better Sometimes I've gone into my phone and I've been like, uh oh, I forgot to upload these species that I took a month ago or whatever the case is. So doing it sooner rather than later is probably a best practice. But whenever you're able to reconnect, you can go ahead and upload the records and I'll walk you through that now. So next slide. Okay, so there is the option to edit. So you'll see that pencil um, or pen icon. And it's it's outlined in red right now. You can click on that to go back into edit your species. There's always an option if you forgot something or realized you got something wrong. And then the next one is checkbox. You can check multiple species at a time, or for our case, we'll just check that one fake species. 
and then um, uh, you'll you can that will select it to upload it. So next, and then you go back to that hamburger button, which brings you back to the drop down but, um, menu. So those three uh, lines, and then just hit upload se selected. You can go ahead and do that now with your fake species. And then hopefully it'll pop up a message that says, are you sure? Um, so you can always back out if you forget, but you can um, just verify, go ahead and hit okay for right now to test it out. And then your screen will be blank. And that means that you have submitted it. So next slide. And so just, this is just a side-by-side -side comparison. You know, if on the left here, if you have those, that, um, those, a list of species on your home page of the app that you still have not uploaded them. It will disappear. Um, and it even says at the bottom records to upload one or records to upload zero, whatever the case might be. So it is just really important to remember to actually upload from the app. Um, I know it happens to the best of us is we just um, forget to do it. So that really, um, it's simple. Um, as long as you go through step by step, um, it's simple to use the mobile app and, and you're providing some really um, valuable data to people. So um, it looks like maybe we have some questions or something to discuss. Um, if, if we do, Meg or Mitch, do you have something that we need to go over before we move on? Um, I don't see any burning questions right, right now. Uh, one thing I do sometimes like to, to mention here is that um, at my first training, my card was red and I was a little bit confused because everyone else's was yellow and um, I, it wouldn't let me upload it. Um, so that can happen if you forgot to pick the species. Um, so I just went in with a little pencil button and I added the species and then my card turned yellow and I was able to upload it. Um, and yeah, any questions into the chat box? And um, thank you, Andrew, for going through the mobile app. I hope um, everyone was able to submit fake records who wanted to. Um, and so next, um, that's as far as you need to go. Um, so now if your app's all set up, your account's all set up, um, you don't really need to go through that again necessarily, unless say, you want to join a project and then you need to hit retrieve IMAP list again for it to populate in your app. Um, but in general, you should be all good to go. Um, and so, but if you're interested, um, so it looks like the data just disappeared on off of your phone. Um, I just want to show you that it does go into our online database. Um, so I will shift back to the online web application. Um, so this would be, you would access it through your browser. Um, you don't need to follow along with me right now. I'll just show you live in a minute. Um, you can just watch my screen. Um, and so some things you can do on the online website. Um, again, this is not required. The big thing is to report invasives you find on your phone. Um, this is just if you want to learn some more about invasives. Um, so using the website, you can use the filter tool to filter which species you're seeing. You can turn different layers on and off. Uh, you can use this export report tool to do some cool things. And there's also these distribution layers that you can make. Um, so I will share my screen. Well, I'm sharing my screen, but I'll share my browser now. All right, so some points are popping up. I will refresh. Um, so what I'm showing you right now is a map of um, fake species in New York State. And I think I am seeing some new ones pop up. Um, so if you have just uploaded a record, um, you might be seeing a little pink dot near your location. Um, and then I'll just point out some features of the website that you might be interested in. So the way that I am looking at just these fake species records, um, for one, I have only toggled on unconfirmed species over here. 
um, because these, these fake records, they were just entered into the database. And um, since they're not real records, we're not going to confirm them. We'll just periodically um, take them out of the database. Um, but even if you uploaded a real species, um, it wouldn't be confirmed immediately. It would need a little bit for someone to go in and review it. Um, but so I just mentioned these layers. So you could, oh, right, a lot of you just made, um, Andrew suggested making uh, not detected. So some of your points were not visible yet until I turned on that not detected layer. Um, so there's so some yellow points popping up around as well. And um, the way that I showed just fake species is using this filter tool at the top, up here, filter tool. So I have this filter running where I've entered fake species in here. Um, some other cool things you can do with this filter tool is after you've gone out a few times, you could filter on your own records, and that'd be a cool way to see all the places you've uh, recorded invasive species. Um, and if you're interested in a certain species, you can put that in there. Um, search based on habitat type. If you're interested in like aquatic species or something, um, there's lots of opportunities for exploring in here. Um, and some other things I'll make you aware of. Um, there's this export report tool. You can run these reports. Um, you can play around with these a little bit. Um, you can make a list for all the species in a certain geography. So you could pick your county to get the invasive species list um, if you want to learn more about what species are in your county. Um, you could also, if you're filtered on your own records, you can also do this species list by geography to get sort of a report on your observation. So it would be a list of all the species that you've recorded and how many you've recorded for each one. So that's cool to see as well. And then one last thing I'll note is this add distribution layer. So this allows you to make some really cool maps for anyone who's interested in. Um, it it uh, follows whatever you're filtering on. So if I do this right now, it'll make a distribution map for fake species, but you could do this on any species you're interested in. Um, so right now I have it on new distribution by county or district, and you can pick whatever color you want. And I'll click show distribution layer, um, I'll include these unconfirmed that you have just added. And so then it lights up the counties where um, fake species has been recorded. Um, if you, these might be more interesting maps if you look at um, a real species that you're interested in. Um, and there's other things you can have the distribution map uh, show by, be viewed by. Um, for instance, if you were looking at a, an aquatic invasive species like water chestnut or something, you could, could uh, view the distribution by water bodies or hydro basins. Um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can do with this interface. Um, so if you're interested, uh, give it a shot. Um, if it's overwhelming, then you don't really have to worry about it. The most important part is um, uploading records with your phone. And so that's everything I wanted to show on here. So I will go back to my PowerPoint. Taking a peek at the chat box. And so, um, since we just went through a lot, um, I just want to make sure everyone knows about the different resources that are online to help you once you're no longer on this call. Um, so there's the New York IMAP Invasives.org, which I showed you briefly before on how to get to logging in. Um, so on that page, there's all sorts of resources, um, especially under resources and training, uh, where you can view recordings of past webinars. Um, you can register for upcoming webinars. There's 
excuse me, online health docs and tutorials and some invasive species guides as well. Um, and then there's also this IMAP help desk. So you can email that imapinvasive at dec.ny.gov and um, that will go to me so I can help you out or forward it to someone on our team that can. And so we've finished the first half of our agenda. So I went over setting up the account. Andrew showed us how to use the app. And then I showed us what happens to your data online. And so with that, I think we can switch over to our um, invasive species ID portion. So we're going to cover a couple invasive species. And I have the first one. So I'll start with uh, knotweed. All right, so uh, knotweed is a invasive shrub native to East Asia, and it can grow up to 10 feet high. Um, in this picture, it's maybe six or seven feet high, as you can see with the person for scale. Um, so it's this shrub that you'll find along, um, it's found in a lot of places. It's pretty pervasive in New York. Um, it'll be along the sides of roads, um, it's often on the sides of streams, um, and it can be very destructive. And it's very difficult to get rid of because um, of the roots that you could remove the whole plant, but if a little chunk of root is left in the ground, it can all grow back. This is this invasive is a pretty big problem. Um, and in terms of identifying it, uh, you'll be looking for that big sort of shrubby growth. Um, and some more details on the leaves. Um, so the leaves are alternate. You can see that here's a branch going down and the leaves are on alternating sides going down the branch. And the leaves are these sort of shovel shaped leaves that they're pretty broad and they go down to a point. Um, and they have smooth edges so they don't have like jagged toothed edges. Um, that's called an entire leaf margin. And um, so really the distinctive feature are these like red zigzaggy branches with alternating shovel shaped leaves. So I kind of put in a red zigzag. This is um, one of the telltale signs of Japanese knotweed, often this dark purplish reddish uh, zigzag branch. Um, and so not yet. Um, there won't be flowers yet, but eventually, like later in the summer, um, these plants put out tons of flowers. Um, so they're arranged in spikes at the bases of each leaf. Um, so there's a close up here on the right and on the plant in the, the picture in the middle, you can see like at the base of each leaf is where this stalk of flowers is visible. And so these spikes have many small flowers on them and these are Tiny flowers with five petals. Um, they usually range from white to maybe a light green. And one thing I'll mention is that there are multiple species in this knotweed genus that are difficult to distinguish in the field. So there's multiple species, they hybridize. Um, you can see in the picture, uh, there's those three leaf types. And it, you can see the difference in this picture, but if you were out in the field and you just had one plant you're looking at, it's kind of hard to tell which one it is, especially uh, between the Bohemian knotweed and the Japanese knotweed. And because these species are so similar and they uh, interbreed with one another, um, there's a ton of variation in this leaf uh, size. Um, so we recommend using this knotweed species unknown option rather than trying to identify um, which species of knotweed it is. So you can just use that knotweed unknown for when you find knotweed in the field. And then our next species is Tree of Heaven, which Andrew will go over. Okay, yeah, so Tree of, uh, tree of Heaven is a really important species right now. Uh, we mentioned sort of briefly before that um, spotted lanternfly or SLF, uh, is, this is their preferred host tree, is Tree of Heaven. So this species in particular is, is quite prolific. You can see it grows just about anywhere. 
It does not like a uh, really dense canopy forest. It can't tolerate a lot of shade, but pretty much anywhere there's sun in this photo here, you can see it sort of growing out of the foundation of a house or a, a building. And uh, so, it, it, and it's quite prolific in New York. It's found in a lot of places. So this species is a, sort of a perfect example where not only are we looking for data on where it is, but we're looking on data for, uh, for where it isn't. So if you, um, in your backyard or your neighborhood or somewhere that you frequent is that you find Tree of Heaven or don't find Tree of Heaven, that would be a really important uh, thing to share with our um, using the IMAP app or web application. And um, so Tree of Heaven has a huge leaf. So this, um, in this photo with the green um, Tree of Heaven of the leaf, this whole thing is one leaf and each of those, um, each of those smaller leaves is actually a leaflet. So um, a tree of heaven leaf can have up to 40 leaflets on it. And if you look closely at those leaves, you'll see sort of like a nodule or a bump at the base of each leaflet. And for me, this is always sort of my go-to way to tell it apart from um, staghorn sumac. So staghorn sumac is a common lookalike around here. People confuse it a lot. Um, and tree of heaven, um, Tree of Heaven does only does not have a tooth or a serration along the whole edge. It just has this one bump, um, and then it also has um, it doesn't have like a fuzzy pubescent bark. It has uh, a more standard bark that you would think of um, on a small tree, but Staghorn Sumac has this fuzzy pubescent bark that's really hairy, um, and, and that is a one way to tell it apart. And then this photo isn't great of the leaf but you can actually tell that margin, the edge of the leaf has these little teeth on it, this serration along the edge. And that is a, a, that helps you sort of differentiate between the two. Um, and DEC does have some good identification resources and there's, these are pretty common species. So you can do a quick Google search just to try and tell, learn more about the difference if you are confused. Um, but I always say, look for that node at, at the base of the leaf. Um, and, you know, so, um, but this is an important one because of this next to be on the lookout for because of this next slide, um, which is the spotted lantern fly. Um, and, and so the tree of heaven is the preferred sort of host tree of spotted lantern fly. And that's why we're so concerned of it for when we think about managing against uh, the uh, spotted lantern fly, which is currently in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's originally from Asia. Um, we really want to know where this tree of heaven is or isn't. And this photo here, actually, that's the SLF and egg masses, SLF being spotted lanternfly. It's like a bark. And the uh, older it gets, the more distinct it sort of gets. Um, but that is a good indicator as well. Spotted lanternfly is a huge concern because it attacks so many uh, agricultural um, species in New York State and the surrounding region. Uh, Pennsylvania has sort of been devastated as far as its infestation when it comes to grape plants, cherry trees, hops. Um, a lot of these significant um, agricultural species that we really want to protect. So we need people to be looking out for spotted lanternfly as well. Um, and spotted lanternfly has these four um, stages of its larval um, life cycle. And for three out of the four, it looks like this picture right here, the spotted lanternfly larva with the black and white um, uh, on its body. In its fourth instar, that fourth stage of its, um, of its larval life cycle, it will get red spots on it as well. Um, and then of course you have the adult, which is very colorful when its wings are spread out. It has those spots on it. And, but when its wings are closed, which is when you're most likely to see it, you know, it could even blend in very well. You can see it sort of blends into this tree. Um, and it will lay its eggs pretty much anywhere. And you can tell one of these, this egg on the left, upper left is, is the covered egg mass. So it's smooth and a light gray. And then the uncovered egg mass is sort of these individual bumpy units. Um, you know, a lot of moths and insects lay similar egg masses, so it's sometimes really hard for people to discern. But whenever you're thinking about transporting something, you don't want to be transporting egg masses in general. Um, so, you know, it's something we encourage to look on your vehicles, your recreational vehicles, your boats, 
your firewood because spotted lanternfly will lay eggs pretty much anywhere. Um, and that, of course, spotted lanternfly is something you can report through the IMF app as well. Um, if you if you do come across it, and th that's definitely a priority species for us to have people be on the lookout for. All right. So the next species is Phragmites, which I'll be uh, talking about. Um, so Phragmites is actually the genus name, uh, Phragmites australis, and the common name is common reed, but I think I more commonly hear it called Phragmites. Um, so this is a grass. Um, it's Eurasian in origin, uh, but it's now um, all across New York, um, and you've probably all seen this plant at some point. So um, it's kind of a tall grass with a very distinctive tuff, tufty seed head on the top. Um, it can get to 6 to 13 feet. You can sort of see that in the picture on the left uh, with the person there for scale, um, and these start out as green color, as you can see on the middle picture with Phragmites on the side of a road. Um, and then they can also get to this straw color, like in the picture on the left. And then on the right is a more close-up of uh, two stalks so that you can sort of see what's going on. Um, and this plant um, is very common on the side of roads, and um, it forms these dense monocultures. Um, they invade wetlands and crowd out all the native species. Um, so you've probably seen this species. Um, and if you haven't, uh, keep your eye out for it um, next time you're in the car. And some more info on how to ID it. So these sort of tufty seed heads are pretty distinctive. They start out a deep purple red, and then they turn straw colored. Um, you might see both of these um, even at this point in the year. Um, you'll see the, the green plants with the darker tufts as well as the sort of straw-colored stalk. Um, this is a close-up to see how the blades are arranged on the leaf. Um, as you can see, it's a green stem with uh, leaves coming off of it or blades coming off of it. And uh, these are all 10 to 20 inches long and they're about um, an inch wide. And another cool thing you can check with these species, that's another identifying uh, feature, is if you take one of the blades um, and sort of peel it off the stem a little bit, you'll see these long hairs um, on what is called the ligule, um, where the blade hits the stem, and these long hairs are pretty distinctive for Phragmites as well. Um, so you can keep your eye out for this species and uh, record observations uh, when you see it when you're out walking as well. And then next we'll talk about, or Andrew will talk about giant hogweed. Okay, so giant hogweed is definitely something we want to be on the lookout for just because it's actually, um, you know, quite a risky plant. It's not something you want to touch. Um, this plant actually causes a, a, a photosensitivity on the skin and you can get severe burns after coming into contact with this plant. So it's definitely something we don't want to touch, but it's something if you do see, uh, we want it to report. And I guess the thing I really want to stress about giant hogweed is it's truly giant. Um, it's, you know, between 7 and 14 feet tall. Uh, it has these giant um, umbrella-like white flowers that are up to two and a half feet across. The stem itself is, is two to four inches thick. Um, and the stem is a great identifier because it has these purple spots and it also has these hairs along the, the edges um, or where the central stem and then the uh, connect. Um, it will have this thick circle of hairs. And then the leaves itself are these compound leaves that are really thick and they're up to five feet wide. So it's truly massive. Um, and, you know, DEC has had a lot of success um, responding to this plant, but we need your help to know where the populations are in order to eradicate it from those areas. Um, next slide. So these are, there's a lot of lookalikes. Cow parsnip is probably the closest because it does also get very large. 
um, but it doesn't get as large. And probably the best way to tell on cow parsnip is it doesn't have any purpling on its um, stem. So it's a solid green and it won't have those uh, hairs around the, um, that the, where the two stems connect. And the flowers are smaller and it is generally overall a smaller plant. Angelica can be a little trippy, tricky because it can get purple on its stem, but it tends to be more of a purple patch as opposed to purple spots. Um, it, it's not quite as big, but it can get big. Um, and it has a smaller, more tightly clustered white flower. Green Anne's lace is quite common. Um, you see it in fields a lot, which giant hogweed can also grow in fields, on roadsides. It likes open sun. Um, but Queen Anne's lace is really small and it has this really sort of feathery leaf. So it's that's probably the most discernible um, of the of the look likes. But there are other things that look alike. DEC has a great poster online on the giant hogweed page that actually goes through some of the looks look alike. So that may be something you want to check in on. Um, but of course, um, next slide. This is a species we want you to help report because we've had such a great success um, eradicating it when people do report it. This is an, uh, this green outlines a uh, giant hogweed infestation that was reported um, to us and um, it was confirmed in 2013 and it was treated that year. And then I think, what was it, 2019? Um, it's no longer detected. So we've managed to um, go back every year and we go back every year to landowners across the state to treat and uh, treat the hogweed populations until they're eradicated from that area. Um, so that's this is a really a species that we've had such a great success with because of folks like you who are out there looking for it and reporting it. Um, so we really want to push that continued effort. Um, and I think we've just reviewed, reviewed obviously a couple of a lot of the species that you can report. Um, there's obviously a lot more to learn. But there's plenty of things you can find in your backyard or your neighborhood to identify. Next slide. So this webinar is actually part of ISAW, the Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, and this brings me back sort of to the PRISMs because the PRISMs are hosting um, uh, Invasive Species Awareness Challenge. Every day of the week they're posting on their social media. I'd encourage you to identify your PRISM and find them on social media. And they're posting a different challenge that you can participate in by posting on your preferred social media using the hashtag NYISAW, New York ISA. Um, and so today's challenge is actually to go out and use this app and take a photo or two and post it on social media of yourself using IMAP Invasive. So that would be a great way to test out the skills that you just learned, keep your, keep your um, skills sharp, right? You've got to practice after you learn it and um, then share on social media using that hashtag. And you can follow the social, the prisms to get more information of all sorts, including on this challenge. And then of course you can visit nyisaw.org uh, where we have the challenge posted and um, uh, you can find out more uh, sessions like this where you can uh, learn more about invasive species. Great. Uh, thank you, Andrew. So we've gone over the how to use IMAP Invasive and the mobile app, and we've gone through these four species that you can keep an eye out for. Um, and so really, like Andrew said, we encourage you to submit, go out and submit a record. So you could do that today for the I Saw Challenge. And I just want to put up this slide to show you how you can stay connected with IMAP Invasive. Um, so you can go to our website, um, especially our webinar trainings tab to see what webinars are coming up. One example is this invasive species mapping challenge that we do each year, this is the fifth year we've done it. And on June 24th, we're doing an introductory webinar um, where you will get a review on how to use IMAP invasives and also learn some ID tips on these four species that we're focusing on um, from some experts across the state. And then I also put on our social media so you can follow us there as well. And with that, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, you can type in your questions into the chat box. Um, I also have the website and my email for you to contact me later. Um, links to upcoming webinars and 
uh, New York Invasive Species Awareness Week website. And then also, I, not, I don't remember if I mentioned this yet, um, but it was in one of the descriptions for this webinar. Um, if anyone is having like particular issues with IMAP and they feel like they need custom one-on-one -on -one troubleshooting help, um, you can email that email, imapinvasive at dec.my.gov with your issue or your question, uh, preferably with as many details as you can provide. Um, and it's also great to know what device you're using to help us troubleshoot. And so we are available for about a half hour after this webinar um, to do some help if anyone needs that. And with that, we can go into any questions that there are right now. Yes, thank you, Joel. There are some questions in the chat box. Um, one was a question about projects. You do not need to be part of a project. Um, do you want to elaborate on uh, projects any more than that, Mitchell? Sure. Um, yeah, you don't need to join any projects unless you're involved in some sort of project. So, for instance, this if you came on to the June 21st, June 24th Invasive Species Mapping Challenge, we will probably have a project set up that you can join so that you can tag your records onto that when you do uh, volunteering for that project. Um, your PRISM might be doing some sort of volunteer effort. Um, I know a couple of PRISMs that are doing that. So if you uh, get connected to your PRISM and you end up joining uh, one of their Invasive species efforts, um, they would probably tell you a project that you would need to join, but there's no requirement to do so. So if you just um, use it more casually, um, you keep your eye out for invasive species while you're on walks and you record them where you find them, um, then you don't need to join an organization or project. Thank you. Um... I don't see any other. I'm going to answer one in the chat box through the chat box. I don't see anything else that we have that is a need to answer as the group at this time. I also don't see any tech questions, but those probably would be headed to the IMAP box. I do know um, there are people on the call who do have that forgot password need that we mentioned. Um, unless the old email is not an email you have access to and you want to create a new account, that's an option. And some people haven't yet um, created an account or submitted a fake species. If they do want to work through that with us, as Mitchell said, we are available to help for the next 30 minutes. Uh, so I do see one question about how should we enter data if we're not sure of the species. Um, for example, the uh, swallow wart. Oh, I see. Meg has answered that. Um, but for, for some species, um, we have a uh, more generic species that you can enter. So, for example, knotweed un species unknown, which I talked about before, so for some um, invasives where there's two very similar species, um, there's that option. And also, if you're, you think it's an invasive species, but you're not quite sure, um, for instance, the, uh, I, the name of the species is not coming to my mind, but there's a native species that looks exactly, almost exactly the same, except it has a white spot in the middle. Um, the, uh, native pine soar, sawyer beetle, I think. White, um, white pine, white sawyer pine beetle? Yes. And then the invasive is the longhorn, the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, so if you're not sure, you can still take the picture. And if you take a good picture, then one of our experts can go in and uh, check which species it is, and they can make the final identification uh, decision. So we're not expecting everyone to be invasive species identification experts. Um, if you think it's an invasive species, you can report it and it will go in unconfirmed and then someone will 
essentially go in and confirm which species it is. And like Meg said, if it, 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 if it does end up being like a native looker like or something, um, we can take that record out of the database once an expert has gone in and looked at it. And Mindy, so uh, thanks for your comment. And one thing I'll say is that IMAP app requests access to your phone's camera so that you can take the picture um, of the invasive species. Um, so if you're not comfortable with that, there are options for recording species using the online interface as well, where you can add pictures. So that is something you can look into as well. Well, again, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. You're very important uh, in this in these statewide efforts uh, to figure out where invasive species are and how we can manage them. So we're really excited that you're all on this call and participating in New York Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, so thank you all for coming, and thank you to Andrew uh, Randazzo with the DEC for helping out with the IMAP training and the invasive species training. Um, and thank you to Meg Wilkinson for helping out with questions in the chat box. So have a yes. great. This is Awareness Week, everybody.